Okay, I want to welcome you again on today's tutorial. My name once again is Joe from Tare, and today we are going to be discussing about this fixation. Yeah, we understand in a pathology or in histopathology when we receive samples or biopsies from wherever they come from, but most especially from uh, the surgical theater, we need to fix them immediately so that they cannot deteriorate because once they deteriorate they undergo uh, postmortem changes then we may lose out on some distinctive features which may be very important during our diagnosis so today we need to look at what fixation is why do we really fix and the different types of fixatives that we use during fixation Again, I want to thank you for always watching my tutorials on YouTube and I encourage you to continue sharing, subscribe, click uh, on that button you're seeing down in there to subscribe or else press that bell so that you can be updated wherever I, uh, I will post a new video or other posts in relation to this will be posted. Continue sharing, liking and resharing these videos so that we can help other people out there. So starting straight away, we shall really look at what fixation is. So fixation uh, is uh, actually the main purpose of fixation is to preserve the tissue in such a way that it appears the same uh, in the microscope preparation as it would really appear while in a living and functioning state. Though what we need to appreciate here that we cannot actually have it being in the very state like in which it was because in the first case to be killed and then other changes are going to happen some chemical changes and some physical changes as a result of it being applied to these different chemicals the fixatives so they can either cause precipitation they call some uh, coagulation uh, methylene bridges will be formed and other changes there could be even other some structure changes but what is uh, very much important here is that we retain the element relationship between the features in the tissue or the cells and then the morphology is also maintained so that it can be easily appreciated. So we really acknowledge that this is a, an impossible aim though we really need to make it as much as we can so that we retain it in a a way that appears almost similar to when it was still living but this is really impossible nevertheless the aim should actually be to approach this ideal as close as possible we need to really try to make this resemblance uh, appear at least to a certain extent so when we are doing fixation we use chemicals which we call the fixatives and I'm saying these fixatives, these are substances which preserve the shape, the structures, relationship and chemical constituents of tissues and cells after death. Therefore, fixation is the process of maintaining tissue or cell morphology in a life-like state as much as possible. So though these cells and tissues are dead, we put them in fixatives which maintain their shape, structure, and the relationship with the other organelles or other structures in a way which is likened to how they appeared before they died or before they were removed from the body. So what we need to note is that fixation actually helps to prevent postmortem changes like autolysis and uh, petrification. So autolysis, when you talk about autolysis, this is a, an enzymatic degradation or breakdown of the tissue or the cells. Uh, like we're saying autolysis, it's auto breakdown, automatic from the enzymes that are within the body. So this is an inborn system. So when we don't fix uh, these tissues, automatically the autolytic process will take place and the enzymes will break down these tissues and cells and definitely we shall not have what we need and then petrifaction uh, actually this is where the tissue is broken down by uh, microflora or microorganisms which actually invent the tissue and digest it so we have in this illustration here in this image we have an image of a fresh tissue 
uh, this is a forceps this is a tissue so this tissue is not yet yeah, actually uh, fixed but we shall fix it in later on so let's look at the terminologies that we use in fixation because along and when you do practice in your different labs in your pathology labs in your cytol labs we shall actually encounter many times these terms and we need to get really to understand what they really mean so we have a, a term here we call secondary fixation so this is a uh, fixation uh, which happens after the first fixation in this case the tissue is treated with an appropriate fixative e.g. zenkaz fomo or uh, hydenaz susa and the second fixation or treatment is purposely to improve the preservation and or staining of specific tissue elements fine we may stain tissues with the primary or the most commonly used the fixative and this the 10 percent formosaline as we look at it but formosaline has its own shortcomings so we may have some interest in some particular elements that we may need to demonstrate and for this case we may be forced to go for secondary fixation where we refix the tissue with a secondary fixative which has different uh, fixing properties like for example Zenka's formal and the head hand susa which may actually help in identifying and improving the staining pattern of specific elements of interest in the tissue so another term we come across is what we call post fixation yes so here some proteins are masked by fat substances uh, which do not allow fixative to penetrate properly and what we need to understand that when a tissue is not properly uh, fixed then it will also not stain well so we need to ensure that if we have elements of interest we must make sure that they are really fixed well should they not be fixed well then we know we are going to lose out on the uh, particular features after staining because they want to be stained so to be able to demonstrate such proteins the tissue is fixed dehydrated cleared and then later fixed in ethanol to preserve the proteins of interest proteins will be fixed i mean ethanol we shall look at the properties of different fixatives and the ethanol is one of those fixatives which actually preserve the tissue by causing coagulation so they will cause coagulation of uh, the proteins so they cannot actually be dissolved away but they'll be maintained can be studied so another term that we shall encounter is what we call washing out so washing of tissue in running water is actually what we are referring to here and the purpose is to remove uh, the excess of the fixative on the on the tissue so when we uh, we fix the tissue uh, the tissue will take in the fixative but then there will be some excess of the system which will remain on the surface of the tissue and the purpose we really need to wash off this fixative is because some fixatives when not washed out can actually react uh, with dehydrating agents during uh, tissue processing like for example potassium dichromate and osium tetroxide can react with ethanol and when they react they can form pigments which can actually result into fixed uh, fixing pigments and when you have pigments in the tissue this can interfere with the interpretation of the structures and some pathological features which may actually be misinterpreted to be artifacts or otherwise interpreting artifacts to be pathological changes yet we do not want to have that so another term that we come across is what we call uh, post chromatization so this refers to the treatment of the tissue with 3% potassium dichromate after normal fixation and this is important since it links tissue elements to stains being applied like for example in the mitochondria actually potassium dichromate we shall come across it at uh, some level and we shall see that uh, at some time it acts as a mordant to link the stain with the tissue it's like a mordant so it can be uh, done by treating the tissue sections with 3% potassium dichromate for 12 to 24 hours and uh, what we need to note in this that uh, post chromatization is uh, also known as 
uh, postgromic and usually applies to tissue fixed in formal saline. We shall look at the difference of 10% uh, formal saline and then 10% formalin. These are different. They may sound almost similar, but they are different. We shall look at the differences. So the purpose of postgromic is to mordant the tissue. Just like I mentioned before, we know a mordant, this is a substance which is going actually to increase how the tissue reacts with the stain so that it can form the color of interest in the tissue that we really need so it, it enhances staining in short terms so however post chroming is different from post mordanting and this we notice that in the letter uh, and this is a uh, post mordanting this is carried out after staining like for example when we look at a uh, gram stain we apply the gram iodine after we have applied the primary stain which is crystal violet so that is the post modernity yes post chroming is not the same as post modernity so we need to take uh, a keen interest in identifying the difference between those two though they can be interchangeably used but they are actually different they may refer to different processes so let's look at what we call post-mortem changes so when we talk about post-mortem changes here we refer to changes that place take place on cell or tissues after death of an organism and in this we mean changes that take place in a cell or tissue after it has been removed from a living person or when the, 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 the biopsy or the tissue has been removed from the body and it is, it, it is dead. So just like I mentioned in the beginning, there are majorly two processes which take place and this is autolysis and then petrifaction. So the changes will include autolysis and petrifaction just like I said and autolysis simply refers to the destruction of cells or tissue which will be caused by enzymes produced by lysosomes which digest away the different cellular components following death and then on the other hand we look at petrifaction which is actually the destruction of cells or tissue by normal flora found in normal and pathological conditions so this uh, petrifaction can actually be caused either by normal flowers found within the body or by pathological conditions like for example TB uh, if you have TB in the lung and you picked uh, a lung biopsy actually petrifaction can take a place as a result of the TB bacilli found in the liver if you do not fix the tissue immediately so uh, when petrifaction happens it will cause digestion and breakdown of the tissues and the cells and the formation of gas which may lead to production of that filthy smell which normally comes out of dead or rotting things as a result of a breakdown of the tissues and the cells by those uh, microorganisms which could be either uh, normal flowers or really pathological uh, changes in uh, the body so we need to take note that the postmortem changes are mostly prominent in highly specialized tissues uh, like the liver intestinal tract kidney and brain so what we mean here is that uh, in case of death the organs where petrifaction would actually take place first or where rotting if i can put it uh, in that term would actually happen first in those well specialized organs like the liver, the kidney, the heart, the intestines, the brain, and so on, they are high, they, they, they are highly active, and the petrifaction will actually take a place, and the autolysis will also take place very quickly. So, we need to look at the purposes of fixation. Why do we fix? So, number one, we need to kill the tissue, and how we kill the tissue, we kill the tissue by denaturing the proteins so these proteins need to be natured and when you talk about proteins here we even referring to enzymes so the naturation of proteins is going to cause the fixation so the major point here that we are actually looking at is the naturing proteins and we very much know that proteins are enzymes at the same time so this is done so that postmortem activities such as petrifaction which is a bacterial attack 
and the autolysis, which is an enzyme attack, can be prevented. So bacteria attack can be prevented by observing very strict antiseptic technique while autolysis by altering the, altering the shape of the enzyme by fixatives which lead to destruction of tissue biological activity. So when the enzymes are actually destroyed, when they are killed, uh, there is no enzymatic activity which can take place and this means there will be no autolysis or digestion of the cellular components or the tissue itself. So another purpose for fixing the tissue is by, it helps us in fixing and stabilizing the tissue element. You remember we said that we wanted to maintain the relationship and we maintain the morphology, the shape and the other uh, structures of interest. So fixing will help by stabilizing how, you know, when we fix these tissues, uh, some fixatives harden, like for example, 10% formosaline, which is normally used, it will harden the tissue so it can keep the tissue in the same place, all the structures in the same place. So this can be done by maintaining the relationship between cells and the cellular substance such as connective tissue, fibers, amorphous ground substances, so that the effect of any subsequent procedure will be minimal. And again, what we need to understand that the fixation is going to help us prepare the tissue for other harsh subsequent procedures which are going to happen in tissue processing. Because in the pathology lab, we are not only ending at fixation, but this is the first step we are taking in processing the sample. Because after fixing it, it's going to be taken into or taken through a very harsh process of tissue processing, which involves it being uh, exposed to very corrosive chemicals, uh, alcohols which are very concentrated. We have corrosive chemicals like xylene and then heat itself. So this prepares the sample or prepares the specimen to be able to uh, undergo that tough process so that it cannot actually be altered. So a well fixed tissue is almost impervious and is resistant to abuse during the process and staining procedures because there are even chemicals that we are going to apply to it during the staining process and all this needs to be taken care of. So number three, uh, one, uh, one other purpose for fixing is that it brings out the differences in refractive index and to increase the visibility of all the contrast between the different elements. So there is an increase in contrast by increasing the refractive index. So with this under microscopy, we can be able now to have contrast and differentiate one element from the other. So uh, fixing any enhances staining and enhances contrast between the different elements of the cell or the tissue. Therefore, it enhances the refractive index of various tissues, structures, which will increase the contract between those structures and this makes the work easier when we are examining the slides and the microscope. So number four, we understand that most staining is enhanced by fixation and frequently tissue that has not been fixed well does not stain. This I mentioned properly. So when we need to really have proper staining, we need to fix the tissue well. So one of the reasons why we need to fix is to enhance staining. So fixatives also aid in rendering tissue constituents such as lipids and carbohydrates insoluble so that they can be studied. Because when we look at some fixatives, they uh, like the alcohols, we shall see that they coagulate the proteins. So in coagulating, they keep them in one place. They cannot leak out. Uh, again, we look at the fixation, uh, which makes the tissue firm so that the gross dissection and the collection of thin section required for processing becomes much easier. In uh, some of my tutorials, I, I mentioned about, we discussed, actually we discussed grossing, what grossing is, but to mention about, uh, to talk about grossing briefly, grossing mm, simply means the macroscopic or the visual description and examination of tissue using your naked eye 
and in this we are interested in identifying or looking at the size the shape the weight and then the color changes the texture of the tissue all this happen in grossing but still away from visibly looking at the tissues we may need to dissect to cut this tissue so that we look at the cut surface what is in there so when we fix these tissues they become hard and it becomes easy for or the, uh, the pathologist grossing the tissue to cut or to dissect them and look inside then away from that if we fix these tissues well they become hard enough and to enable us during microtomy that we can get these small sections which can be applied on the microscope and examined so let's look at the criteria of a good fixative we shall look at a number of them but how do we tell how on which criteria do we best to judge and say that this criteria i mean this fixative like for example uh 10 percent uh, formalin is the best or is a good fixative so we look at different features and one we must be able to maintain the cellular or tissue morphology if a fixative can be able really to maintain the cell and the morphology or that of the tissue without deforming it without causing a lot of shrinkage then that is a very good fixative and then number two it sh should not affect staining after fixing and we go to the process of staining or to the step of staining the fixative we used in the beginning should not actually affect the staining procedure and number three it should be able to evenly and quickly penetrate the tissue because the essence here of fixing is that we want to prevent the postmortem changes from taking place so the quicker the fixative penetrates the tissue to store uh, the catalytic uh, activities uh, and I mean the enzymatic activities in the tissue the better the fixative is so it must have the capacity to quickly penetrate the tissue so that it can fix all the parts of the tissue and then number four it should aid the attachment of the smear onto the slide and prevent washing off during staining because if we are using a fixative which will make the section is uh, fly off not even flying off but falling off the slide then we may have nothing to stain and then our procedure may not be complete so the fixative must be in position to help or to uh, actually aid in the attachment of smear or the slide then number five it should have the ability to inactivate enzymes especially the isomal enzymes to avoid autolysis and then it also uh, must prepare the tissue or the cell for the reagent just like I say that one of the reasons why we do really fix these tissues that we prepare them to make them uh, a little bit tolerant to other aggressive and very corrosive chemicals and heat which is going to be applied to them like xylene alcohols DPX and then the heat when we are taking them through tissue processing so it should also be able to kill bacteria and molds and this should be intended to avoid petrifaction it should be simple to prepare and uh, economical in, in use uh, and should have the ability to make the tissue firm so that grossing and the collection of thin sections required for for processing becomes easier i mentioned and i talked about this and should have the ability to act as a mordant which serves to link the dye and the tissue and this will help us to have good staining at the end so we need to look at the hallmarks of a good fixative what do we really need to identify so that we really confirm that wow this has been really a good fixative so number one we look at the nuclei and with the nuclei it must appear with the various crispy chromatin pattern and a crispy blue nuclear chromatin membrane and this is to say the nuclei should not show any kind of smudgeness bubbling or fading we shall look at what the crispy chromatin is but to briefly talk about that if you have uh, or seen the crisps, crisps most especially potato crisps they have that texture appearance and that's what we are referring to the crispy chromatin so the chromatin must 
appear in a, uh, appear somehow like uh, the precepts you know the color will be different so number two the nuclei should not show any fading it should stain with the uh, consistent uh, chromasia and uh, there should be no any sign of loss of color there should be no cell shrinkage and remember we say that at least for a good fixative it should not shrink because we are interested in maintaining the morphology of the cell and then number four the cell cytoplasm should be preserved and should stay in well with the using uh, smudging and bubbling should actually not be there so here I have an illustration when you critically look at this you can see the crisp appearance on my right here I have the precepts here so when we critically look at the surface of this precip here we can see this texture and this is what we actually expect to really see like in this um, image here when we, we look at this we see the crisp arrangement in the in the nucleus those fine 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 dots uh, which appearing are almost similar now the difference here is in the color that these ones are purple blue and then these ones are yellowish but what we are interested in is the, stick, the texture the crisp appearance in this case it may not be the color for that case so we need to look at the factors that affect the rate of fixation yeah why do fix why does fixing why can't fixing be the same so there are factors which may really affect uh, the different uh, fixing patterns uh, even when we have put uh, the tissue in the in, in the fixative it may actually come out to be fixed well so we need to look at those factors which may affect or which may lead to the tissue being uh, fixed so well so one of them is temperature so we need to appreciate that temperature uh, will really increase the rate at which a fixative will fix the tissue and this is when we remember our basic science we know temperature or heat will increase the movement of the molecules or atoms in a, a substance and when they increase the speed it means they are going to increase also the speed at which these molecules of the fixative are going to penetrate the tissue so in general increasing the temperature of the fixative up to around 45 to 55 degrees centigrade has a little effect on the tissue morphology so we should actually maintain the temperature uh, of the fixative at an optimal uh, uh, grade so that it cannot destroy other elements in the tissue because you will understand that at some point we may need to study some enzymes and we know these enzymes are heat sensitive so when we put the tissue in a very cold fixative it will actually denature you may end up just cooking the tissue and not actually fixing it so there are points to note here that traditionally a uh, refrigerator temperature of zero degrees to four degrees is considered to be ideal for ideal temperature for fixation of specimen for electron microscopy so you will realize as we move ahead that uh, different studies may actually demand for specific staining procedures uh, which may vary from what is commonly or traditionally used as a fixative so depending on what you intend to study on a tissue the choice of the fixative may be determined by such factors if the main purpose is to study some proteins some enzymes some lipids so at some point we may not even need to fix the sample uh, in the formal saline i mean yes in the formal saline in 10 percent uh, formalin but actually we may choose to do cryo section is where we fix the sample by freezing them uh, quick freezing and then we use the cryo sections that can be very important because they will give uh, very good studies about the proteins and then the lipids compared to when they are fixed with the uh, formal saline they are taken through tissue processing there is heat and we may lose some though even still uh, through the I mean, processed samples under formalin and embedded uh, in wax still they can also be studied 
and we can do the immunohistochemistry of some particular elements and study some batches most appropriately it's better on fresh samples so we understand that formaldehyde fixation is performed at room temperature instead of refrigerator temperature and this provides proper tissue preservation and less tissue effects so factor number two is the size so the size is very important and uh, in this case we look at the size of the tissue so when the tissue is very big uh, the fixative may not actually be able to penetrate to reach into deeper parts of the tissue so when we are fixing the tissue we need to consider its size and then we also look at the size i mean the volume of the fixative we are putting in and to a certain point for tissues which are very big or which are big like for example a breast a kidney uh, it may not and uh, like for example the kidney may have even some capsulation uh, and uh, the breast we understand is full of fat and then it, the skin is also hard the fixative may not easily penetrate so what we do with the such big organs we do what we call bread loafing we cut through them to allow the fixative to enter to different parts or to all parts of the tissue so that it can be fixed very well so specimen such as sedimented colon or small intestines should be surgically opened to expose all layers uh, before we put them in the fixative because they are round in that case so we need to expose all the layers so that's the purpose we cut them open so that we allow access of the fixative to all sides of this organ or we do bread loafing like for solid organs like the breast and maybe the kidney so solid organs like breast spleen kidney and this should be covered with adequate fixative and bread loft for that case so another factor which affects the volume and in this case we are looking at the volume of the fixative fine you could have the right concentration of the fixative but if it's not covering the fixative very well then it may not actually fix your tissue very well and in this case at least compared with the tissue the volume of the fixative should be at least 15 to 20 times more than that the volume of the tissue so we understand that the fixative molecules are bound chemically uh, to tissues are chemically bound to 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 to, 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 to tissues mm. yes they are chemically bound to tissues and thus the solution is gradually depleted uh, depletes these molecules so if you have a big uh, tissue that you are trying to fix and then you're having a small volume of, uh, of the fixative uh, the molecules in the fixatives are going to be gradually getting attached to the tissue so at some point you'll have no fixative molecules attaching the tissue in the part which has not been uh, are actually fixed and in that case it will not be fixed we also understand that tissues also contain soluble salts that are dissolved in the fixative and in this they are also reducing on its activity other molecules they are diluting it by dissolving into the fixative so it has the volume has to be big enough so that the dilution of the solutes from the tissue do not actually dilute so much the fixative to a level that it cannot act so when we look at these two ways of exchange uh, we understand that we really need a bigger volume of uh, the uh, fixative to tissue ratio so that we maintain good activity of the fixative and have tissues which are well fixed however if the volume of tissue is greater than that of the solution then the fixative competition composition can be altered leading to poor fixation another factor that we need to appreciate is time yes we really need to process these samples uh, very fast our turnaround time should be standard and they should be short enough because we need to put the interest of the patient uh, above all our personal interest and in this we ought to think about producing results quickly but what we need to understand is that the time given for the fixative to stain I mean to fix the tissue is very important and this may vary depending on the size of the tissue you're fixing and the type
of the tissue it could be the size and then the type like for example if you are having a, a calcified uh, tissue like for example bone a teeth i mean a tooth then this will take a lot of time for it to be uh, to, 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 to be fixed compared to when you're having a small piece uh, a core biopsy which can easily be stained so time is very important so we need to give them tissues ample time to stain very well and uh, then another factor is the choice of a fixative this i mentioned earlier that we shall make a choice of the fixative sometimes depending on the studies we intend to make or depending on the tissues we are really handling but most especially what you do intend to study because as we shall look at different fixatives we shall really come to understand that they have different modes of action and the other modes of action of the fixatives actually may interfere with the studies which may be intended like for example the immunohistochemical tests could be affected to a certain extent uh, by fixing uh, these tissues in, in formalin and the subsequent embedding in the paraffin wax because we shall really uh, appreciate that uh, uh, formalin will make uh, the cross linkages and then the methylene bridges which will actually mask some epitopes of the antigen in the tissue and for you again to study that tissue very well we need to do what we call the antigen retrieval because of the masking of the methylene bridges and the cross linkages formed by the covalent bonds of uh, formalin with the tissue hydrogen bonds so all these factors have to be con co 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 considered and then we look at the penetration rate of the fixative and this we understand that different fixatives also penetrate the tissue different at different levels and we appreciate also that formalin uh, is appreciated that it penetrates faster than any other fixatives so when we are looking at factors which affect we also need to look at that so the other thing is tissue storage so we understand that the method of weight tissue storage is very important because some tissues may be needed for additional studies otherwise if a tissue is not fixed and is stored properly additional studies may actually be impossible and the reason now we know because we appreciate that there are other uh, activities which may be taking place the one was mentioned before uh, the postmortem activities like uh, putrefaction and autolysis so we need to because if some elements have been actually degraded then we may not identify them even when we process the tissue stain and then examine they will not be there and this may lead to actually giving false conclusions so neutral buffer for mycelin has actually been seen as a best solution for tissue storage for long which is not true with many other uh, fixatives though it also has its own shortcomings as we shall see so another factor we look at is the ph the ph of the fixative is very important in preventing formation of pigments maintaining a fixative ph between 7.2 to 7.4 actually prevents formation of pigments in a tissue which can lead to false positives yes we mentioned this one before false positive can occur when you you see a color like for example if you bring immunohistochemical studies and these pigments are appearing brown like for example the maturic uh, pigments they appear brown and somebody can mistake it for being uh, an antigen staining antibody staining which is not actually true so another point we look at is the smolite of the fixative and then the iron composition so the osmolite of the buffer and the fixative is very important and in this case we need to look at the hypertonic and the hypotonic solution this i believe you understand the hypertonic solution this is where the solution has more solute dissolved and then the hypo is the one which has little solute uh, dissolved and then we have the isotonic solution which is at a level almost similar to that of the normal body physiological concentration so the most the best morphological results are actually obtained with solutions that are slightly hypertonic not very hyper but slightly hypertonic another factor we look at that affects uh, 
fixation is suspension so here fixation properties are displayed in line with the way the tissue is suspended in the fixative now what do we mean here where do you place your fixative are you going to put the fixative on the side of the container are you going to put the fixative at the bottom of the container so best fixation is achieved when the tissue is suspended in the fixative itself it's not because when you push it on the side maybe the other side you push it on the wall of the container may not receive enough of the fixative and may not be fixed appropriately so when you suspend it in the middle of the fixative uh, it will be actually fixed so well and that will be very good another factor is agitation and this increased agitation increases the rate at which the tissue is fixed because it will increase the movement of the molecules of the fixatives and this will increase at the rate at which it penetrates the tissue and eventually you get your tissue fixed very well and uh, we look also at the concentration of fixative and we understand and we appreciate that effectiveness of solubility primarily determines the appropriate concentration of a fixative and uh, in the pathology lab we always appreciate the 10 percent buffered saline and uh, this one does not actually cause a lot of shrinkage uh, it increases hardening but it is the optimal that we use for fixing in the lab we to you will find that uh, formal saline uh, I mean 10 percent formalin is the most routinely used uh, fixative for different reasons that we shall actually look at as we move on so another factor that we look at is the additives uh, that are used or that are added in formal saline these are also very important they play a big part most especially if we have particular interests in specific elements that we need to study so uh, in addition of electrolytes like calcium chloride potassium thiocyanide ammonium sulfate and uh, potassium dihydrogen phosphate and many electrolytes like a sucrose and dextran in fixatives improve the morphology of the fixed tissue and these additives may actually react with either direct protein or enzymes causing denaturation or independently with the fixatives and the cellular constraints. So now let's quickly look at the classification of, of uh, these fixatives and we are going to classify them basing on their mode of action. And here let's begin with the alcohols. Alcohols this fix the tissue by actually coagulating proteins and forming a semi-solid structure that hold the structures and prevent them from leaking out of the tissue so when they are fixed irrespective of the rest of the processes that are going to be encountered during tissue processing these have already been solidified and they cannot easily leak out so this mode of action is by coagulation and we have examples which include 100% methanol and then we have 95% ethanol that we commonly <coughs> encounter. So another type of uh, fixative, these are the ones which fall under the category of aldehydes and these specifically fix the tissue by formation of cross linkages and bethidine bridges. And when you talk about cross linking, yeah, just like the name goes, these are uh, cross linkages which will appear like a net and they will mask some epitopes on some proteins so they make they make a mesh around some proteins and they also prevent them from leaking out that's how they actually uh, fix the tissue and these appear like we mesh and hold intracellular structures within the cell they are formed as a result of the interaction between the covalent bonds of the fixative and then the hydrogen bonds within the proteinous structure of the tissue. So we also need to understand that aldehydes also fix tissue by formation of methylene bridges which are similar to cross linkages. So they are responsible for masking epitopes just like I mentioned before in a biological tissue and therefore tissue fixed with aldehydes need to be unmasked before immunohistochemistry procedures are done. And we have examples of these which include the formaldehyde or what you call formalin. Normally we have the glutaldehyde and then the glaxo. 
So there are some key points here to note. And number one, we need to understand that they usually cause extensive cross-linking, hence causing adverse effect in immunohistochemical studies or immunohistochemical methods. And we also need to appreciate that Glauxo is used as a 40% aqua solution and buffered at a pH of 4.0, not 7.2 or 7.4 as it is in a uh, uh, in formalin. So do not cause formation of artifacts like smudge nuclei and a distorted staining as with the formalin and this is the advantage of glyoxo. Uh, they cause a slight reduction in staining when the tissue is stored for long in it so that is a disadvantage and most special stains are satisfactory after glyoxo fixation. It is good that actually it has some more daunting effect though it also has some its uh, shortcomings in that case. So formaldehyde solution is used in the lab. We may have 10% neutral buffered formalin and uh, as we know this is the most widely used solution for routine formalin fixation. It is hypotonic solution with a pH of approximately 7.8 or sometimes 7, I mean 6.8 to 7. Then uh, solution number two is 10% neutralized formalin and we appreciate though this has been widely used, it is not recommended because the solution becomes acidic after withdrawal from the storage. It is not stable enough it easily reacts with the atmospheric oxygen forming formic acid and it's not really a stable solution. So 10% neutralized buffer formalin is important because for it, based on the fact that it has a buffer in it, it is able to maintain its uh, pH. So another solution we encounter is 10% formalin solution or 10% formosaline. And this solution is isotonic, uh, exclusive for exclusive of the formaldehyde but sometimes produces the formalin pigments. So formalin pigments we shall look at how they are formed and uh, how they appear uh, in the subsequent uh, tutorial. So watch out for the subsequent tutorial we shall be looking at uh, the formalin pigments or oh, else I will mention them in the subsequent slides which are coming actually ahead. And then number four we have calcium formalin and this recommended especially for the fixation and the preservation of phospholipids in tissue and then number five we have uh, formalin uh, ammonia bromide which is recommended for tissue specimen in the central nervous system so earlier on we mentioned that a choice of uh, the fixative one may be determined or may be dependent on the type of tissue you're going to fix or not, it could be dependent actually on the type of investigation or the type of study that you're interested in that you want actually to carry on with. Like here we are saying in these uh, explanations where you really identify that we formalin, uh, formalin ammonia bromide is actually appreciated or recommended for tissue specimen of the central nervous system and then we have formocalcium or calcium formalin which is actually recommended and appreciated well in the studies of phospholipids. So depending on the study that you have interest in or depending on the tissue that you have, a choice of the fixative may be determined by such. Yeah, other factors um, um, I mean other uh, solution is, uh, formalin based solution is that we may actually encounter in lab. We may find the modified uh, melonic formalin, we may encounter alcoholic formalin, uh, we may actually come across the phosphate buffered paraformaldehyde, we may encounter the acetate formalin and then 10% aqueous formalin. You can find time and uh, read through these ones. Uh, and understand them better. But what you need to take home, or the most important point to take home here, 
is you need to know the routinely used fixative that you're going to always encounter in your daily practices when you're conducting your studies in your pathology lab. So the most commonly routinely used histology uh, fixative is actually 10% buffered saline, I mean formalin. That's what you're going to encounter always. So why do we choose 10% formalin? Why do we prefer using it? We need to look at some of the characteristics that makes it uh, actually universally appreciable and uh, taken up to be the fixative of choice. Number one, it causes less shrinkage to tissue as compared to other fixatives. Number two, its chemical composition is stable and it can be used for a long time. Remember, we talked about formosaline and we said it is not stable. And the moment you leave it from the container and you open it, it's going to turn and become acidic. Now, the advantage here with the neutral buffer uh, formalin is that for it, it is very stable and can be used for some good time. Number three, it is relatively cheap and readily available as compared to other fixatives. It is easy to prepare. It's very stable and readily available. So anybody would want to use a fixative that he or she can easily get and fix his tissues. So number four, it hardens tissue more than any other fixative except acetone and ethanol. So ethanol and methanol, they actually harden the tissues so much. They would be good fixatives, but the reason why we don't actually use them is this effect that they harden the tissue very much. And even the rate at which they penetrate the tissue is also low. Then, why do you think this is an, a disadvantage? Well, as we need these tissues to be hardened, we need them to be hardened to a certain extent. If they are too hard, again, they become brittle and they break during sectioning or they will produce sections with lines. And that's what we don't want to see. So we find that the most appropriate fixative in this case is actually 10% formalin. And then number five, it allows most sending protocols to be performed on the tissue fixed in it. So when you get tissue fixed with a 10% uh, formalin, you can make an array of tests, a number of tests on it, as opposed to other fixatives, which may only actually be limited, like for example, osmium tetroxide is one fixative we use, but actually for it is actually only used in electronic microscopy. Yet, uh, with the 10% formalin, it can be used for a number of studies, including histological studies and immunohistochemical studies, and even histochemical studies can be done on the tissue which is fixed in formalin. Number six, it quickly and evenly penetrates the tissue compared to other fixatives. And this is a big advantage because we need the fixative which can evenly fix the tissue without leaving any part of the tissue unfixed. So does it mean it doesn't have any disadvantage? No, it does. So what are some of these disadvantages that we have? Number one is that when it is used in addition with the sodium chloride to achieve the correct similarity, and this is a form of saline, uh, the solution becomes acidic by reacting with atmospheric oxygen leading to formation of formic acid which leads to black acid hematin or what we call the formalin pigments which will form actually in the tissue. We shall see how we remove this or how we prevent this from happening in the subsequent slides. And we are, this is common in the tissues containing a lot of blood. So the formalin pigments are formed when the pH of formalin drops below 6. And when we talk about formation of formic acid, we know in acidic conditions the pH actually drops down. And this is the, the, the result. So apart from the aldehydes and the alcohols, we have another type or another category of fixing or fixatives, and these are the ones we call the oxidizing agents. So this also fixed the tissue by formation of cross links, like what it is in formalin. 
and they cross link also the proteins within the tissue and the cells. However, they are not routinely used just because they cause extensive denaturation of proteins. That's why they are not used because when they denature proteins extensively, then that means we are going to lose some elements of interest. Yet at some point, we may be interested in studying some proteins. But if they are denatured completely, then we may not actually study them. So examples may include potassium dichromate and the osmium tetroxide. Those are examples of oxidizing agents that we use in the study. Moving forward, we need to note, take some notes seriously here. So we need to understand that osmium tetroxide is primarily the used for fixation of specimens for electron microscopy. I mentioned this earlier. And we also need to note that it is used in fixation and preservation of fats and lipids in the tissues. That is something very important to note. And it penetrates only a few layers. So the section is, must be extremely thin. And that's why this is actually preferred in electron microscopy. Because in, a, in, electronic, in electronic microscope studies, the sections are, must be ultra thin. We really need ultra thin sections that we use. So it is not a disadvantage in this case. Because even if it only penetrates a few layers, even the section you are going to get for electronic microscope, they are going to be ultra thin sections. That's why it is preferred for that study. Compared to where we shall need a uh, section is of about uh, four micrometers for electro, I mean for light microscopy, and that will not be applicable when the tissue has not been penetrated enough to be fixed. So we shall lose out some staining patterns. Uh, if we use the osmium tetroxide to actually fix tissues which are going to be studied under light microscopy. Four, it causes tissue swelling which can be actually minimized by addition of calcium or sodium chloride in osmium contain fixatives. And number five, potassium dichromate also preserves lipids but not in the same degree as osmium. So if you ask for the best uh, fixative that would be used for fixation of lipids, then I think you know the best choice of the fixative that would go. This is taking us back to what we mentioned before, that the choice of the fixative that you're going to make will, is going to actually to depend on either the studies you want to make or the type of tissue you have at hand that you need to fix. So we have another category of fixatives and these are the ones we call the picrates. And uh, these are fixatives that contain picric acid. Examples, we have the bones and then the Hollande solution. And uh, these ones, they also, their mode of action is by coagulation of uh, proteins. So they coagulate the proteins within the tissue, just like alcohols do. So picrates, like bone solution, they stain everything they come in, into contact with yellow. And this is one of the reasons why it is not a fixative of choice because it may cause misinterpretations uh, of color because it will always stain whatever it comes across. The stain is it yellow, and that's not a good property. In as much as this, it fixes, but it has that side effect of staining unnecessarily. However, this can be removed with 50 to 70 percent ethanol, lithium carbonate and they separate lay or during staining uh, sequences. So the bony solution is an excellent general fixative for connective tissue. This is a point that you need really to take serious. Uh, if we still get back to what we have been mentioning, yeah, you're considering the tissue of choice, I mean the fixative of choice that you want to make, you need to look at what you're going to fix. And then secondly, you have also to look at what, uh, which studies you also need to, or to, to make. So for this case, we are seeing that the body solution is actually an excellent general fixative for connective tissues. And specifically, if you want to make glycogen studies. And then the Hollandes solution is an excellent fixative for gastrointestinal biopsies. And this is very important note. 
and endocrine tissues. So these factors determining the choice of a fixative, I think they have been well touched. Then number four, we also look at the pigments leaving tissue very receptive to acidic dyes like eosin and gives tissue a very good soft consistency. That's a very a good advantage. Number five, uh, the only disadvantage with the pick rate is either causing extreme shrinkage or allows extreme shrinkage to occur in subsequent processing. And why would you think the subsequent uh, processing would result into shrinkage? Because it is going to give it a soft consistency. In the first staining, it did not give it a hard consistency. It was left soft. So in the subsequent uh, staining, you may have it uh, shrinking. So another category of uh, the fixative is what they call the mercurials. And these are fixative that contain mercury chloride, like uh, the zincers, and then the hills, and then the shundins, uh, all matches, the bone lebron, and the B5 solutions. So what we need to note here is that fixatives containing mercury chloride are mostly used in hemopoietic tissues like a bone marrow, liver, spleen, lymph node, and kidney. I mean, and kidney. So you can see the choice of organ and then the choice of fixative. So the major advantage of using a mercury as a fixative is that it leaves the tissue highly receptive to staining. So you fix your tissue with mercury, just know it that when it comes to staining, you'll get the best staining pattern. Number three, mercury is highly poisonous and therefore uh, fixatives containing it are not routinely used because we also need to look at how safe our uh, histotechnologist and the pathologist and the whoever imagine you're grossing and then you're handling mercury. Mercury in the first case it is a uh, it's carcinogenic, uh, it is corrosive, it is poisonous. So nobody would wish to expose his workers or himself to such kind of chemical. And uh, yeah, that's those are some of its botanoids, and that's why it's not actually commonly used. Now, before we need to appreciate that, though to a some extent it is a fair fixative, its mode of action is actually unknown. Number five, we need to appreciate that the presence of mercury in a tissue inhibits freezing and the other four frozen sections are difficult to prepare in the tissues which uh, have uh, mercury in it. So we cannot actually uh, fix the tissue in the mercury and then uh, uh, make a frozen section in it. It will be very impossible. So we've been talking about some colorations, some pigments, and I think it's the time to look at the fixation artifacts. So what do we mean when we mention artifacts? So artifacts are structures or features in the tissue that interfere with the normal histological examination under microscopy. How do they interfere? Their appearance may mimic some pathological changes that could be mistaken or they could actually obscure some pathological elements or pathological features which would actually be identified and make a good con conclusion. So fixation artifacts should actually be avoided as much as possible as we can. So fixation artifacts are pigments that end up being deposited in the tissue after using histological fixatives. And uh, some examples of these fixatives, we have the formalin pigments, we have the pink disease artifacts, we have the chrome depots, mercury chloride pigment, and others. But to look at a few, like for example, if you look at the formalin pigments, I earlier on mentioned how they are formed. So these are at the same time called acid formalin hematin, and they appear as brown granules in a tissue. And the concentration of the pigment is highest in the tissue containing blood vessels due to the presence of hemoglobin, which actually reacts with the formic acid. So the, the principle here is that formic acid is as a result of reaction between the formalin and atmospheric oxygen. So once the formic acid is formed, it's this formic acid which is actually going to 
react with hemoglobin in blood and forming that black pigment we call hematin. So in case we use the buffer, yeah, the buffer will break down the formic acid to water and hydrogen. But however, if they are already present in the tissue, they can be removed using a method we call Barrett's method. So let's look at what the Barrett's method is. So Barrett's method basically this is the method we are going to use to remove the formalin pigments from the tissue. This we are removing after they have already been formed. If we want to prevent formation of these pigments, we use the buffered formalin. But if we have not used the buffered formalin and they have eventually formed, that's why now we apply the Barrett's method to remove the pigments which have formed. So what happens here is that we take the sections to xylene and this may be purpose that we move uh, the cover slip and the DPX which is used for mounting and then we put back this slide in 100% alcohol to remove the xylene which has been used to, to, to remove the, uh, the cover slip and then we hydrate or we bring the slides to water, we rinse in absolute ethanol uh, flood the section with saturate, saturated alcohol picric acid for 5 to 10 minutes. That's the major point that we need to take there. The rest has been good, but here we need to look at what exactly happens or what exactly is needed. So the most important thing here is covering the slide with saturated alcohol picric acid for 5 to 10 minutes. And then we wash in 95% ethanol remove the yellow color of picric acid and then control it microscopically so as you apply as you wash you put on the microscope you examine to see whether the color is getting removed if not you continue so you continue until the color is done away with so if you're sure the color is done away with you have removed the the the, 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 the artifact or the pigment then wash with tap water and then process your slide as usual stain as desired and then examine so another pigment is the mercury chloride pigment and these are the ones we are going to encounter in the materials when we have used the mercury based uh, fixatives so this is a darker brown pigment found in the sections of tissue uh, using fixative containing mercury chloride they are uniformly distributed in sections but can be removed from the tissue during tissue processing by adding 0 0.5 uh -huh. this is now the point to take home what do we really need to so here we add 0 0.5 percent of sodium iodide and now sodium iodide is going to react with the, the mercury chloride forming uh, mercury iodide which is actually uh, soluble and the, the pigment will be done away with so this is the principle here so the pigment are removed by converting the mercury chloride into mercury iodide which is water soluble and in washing away it can actually be done away with so chrome deposits uh, these are formed by oxidizing uh, fixatives like potassium permanganate and these are found in tissue fixed using potassium dichromate. They are fine granules that are removed from tissue by washing sections in running water or washing in 1% acid alcohol and then in water. Then we have the pink disease artifact and these are artifacts found in tissue rapidly fixed in buffered form saline and this is common in the, the in lymph node and epithelial cell and characterized by nucleus failing to stain with hematoxylin and instead taking up eosin which is the reverse so the artifacts are avoided by adding 2% acetic acid to the fixative or by adding 1% hydrochloric acid to absolute ethanol used to dehydrate sections 
troubleshooting we need to really know how to troubleshoot if you encountered an act artifact or uh, uh, a pigment how do you troubleshoot what could be the cause so in this case one we must be thinking about a number of factors which may actually affect our fixing process and one of them we may look at the autolysis caused by delaying of fixation which is solved one by placing the specimen in a fixative solution as soon as possible and ensuring that the volume is at least 15 to 20 times that of the tissue and then uh, we also need to think about surgically opening large specimen or bread loafing if we realize that they were not actually fixed well and we have some parts of the tissue which are not staining or actually which are not staining appropriately it could be an indication of uh, having an autolytic uh, autolytically caused and this can also be done away by opening these tissues or broadening them to allow the to reach all parts of the tissue uh, yes, we talked about bread loafing, cutting open uh, and slicing the big organs like the kidney discipline and the breast to ensure ad uh, adequate fixation. So we have a note that we need to take here and in this we need to appreciate that autolysis may be shown by loss of total disappearance of nuclear chromatin. If you don't see any of that then it could be an indication of autolysis and some cells may disappear such as epithelial cells in intestinal specimens or there may be cell shrinkage with artifactual spaces around the cells so when you see these features that could be an indication that uh, uh, some autolysis could have taken place and resulted in uh, proper staining or improper fixation so because uh, I, I mean another uh, under troubleshooting another thing that we can look at is incomplete fixation and because of rapid turn around the time uh, which is deemed necessary for specimen uh, some specimen may not actually be adequately fixed in the uh, tendency to try and produce results easily but if the tissue is not well fixed when processing has begun, fixation continues in the alcohol and the center of the tissue will often be more isonophilic than the periphery when you're looking at it under the microscope. So if signs of incomplete fixation is noted on H and E stained sections, the following corrective actions should actually be taken. Corrective action number one, increase the time allowed in fixative solution so that it can fix very well and then number two change to another fixative such as zinc formalin which still requires several hours for complete fixation or glycol which is extremely rapid a uh, fixative but then we saw its shortcomings another corrective action would be to place formalin alcohol in the first three changes of the process cycle to decrease fixation time and also begin dehydration. Next corrective action is to ensure that gross sections are thin enough for good reagent penetration and the amount of fixative is at least 15 to 20 percent by volume or 20, 20, 20 times that the volume of that of the tissue. And the next corrective action here again is that we need to ensure that formalin solution is not depleted because of overuse. Remember in our introduction we were looking at we understood very well that uh, the formalin molecules keep attaching its left the tissue. So if it is severally used and interchangeably or for some good time it may be continuously losing the molecules and maybe at the end or uh, at some point in time you could be having less than 10% because the molecules of the formalin itself 
uh, could have been actually used up and now you remain with the biggest percentage of water are not actually having an effective fixation taking place. Then you need to uh, increase adaptation of cassettes in fixatives holding solutions during or after crossing. And uh, this is uh, possibly done uh, in cases we are using manual tissue processing. But for automatic tissue processors, they have an automatic system where they do the adaptation on, it, on themselves. But where manual processes are done, then you really need to do this to make sure you keep agitating the tissue that they can actually be stained appropriately. Uh, another point we need to look at is what you call ischemia time or ischemic time. And uh, uh, this is divided actually into two. We have uh, hot ischemia and then cold ischemia. But for our case, let's talk about cold ischemia because this is actually what is going to happen to us so much during uh, our pathology practice. So cold ischemia time is defined as the time from the removal of the tissue from the patient to the initiation of the tissue uh, fixation. So the time, the time from when the tissue has been excised, it has been removed from the living organism to the time when it is going to be put in the fixed team, I mean the, 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 the fixative, that time is what we call a scam time. And this time should be reduced as much as possible, reason being that we need actually to avoid as much as possible to prevent as much as possible the happening of the postmortem changes on our tissue because should it happen then we may not have uh, our some of the elements uh, that we may actually need or even the entire biopsy could be actually rendered uh, inappropriate for examination after undergoing autolytic or putrefaction process so this time should be shortened as much as possible specifically for not more than an hour so I want to thank you for watching uh, this tutorial from the time we started up to where we have reached and uh, as we conclude at the end I have some two slides that I left with some revision questions that can actually help you to memorize and see whether you have really understood uh, the topic and what we have gone through so I have some questions for you purposely for your revision so you can define fixation coagulative fixation and non-coagulative fixation and the rest uh, list down the function is of, of fixation and then other questions as you can see them and once you are able to answer all these questions then you will be have actually learned properly and you will be ready to answer the questions that come along in line with the fixation and the fixatives i want you to i want to thank you again for actually taking time to watch and listen to me thank you for sharing these tutorials thank you for liking my page thank you for subscribing and thank you for sharing i encourage you that as you finished listening to me as you finished watching if you have been blessed if you've been encouraged if you have understood if you feel this is good content to be shared, kindly share with a friend, share with the school, and share with any other person that you feel would be interested in learning and understanding this. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share. And don't forget to like. Thank you so much. Meet you next time. Goodbye for now.